second. You're good. Because uh... I'm on two monitors. Give me one second. I'm gonna I'm a dance to some music. Bing, bing, bing. Bing, 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 bing. Hello, 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 my friends. Thank you for joining me on Person Behind the Pages, the show where we get to know the creators that make the things we love. I'm your host, Nicholas W. Fuller, and I'm joined today by Simon Carr. How you doing, Simon? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing really good. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. I'm really psyched to talk with you. I've been talking with lots of authors lately, but I haven't gotten a chance to sit down with a cover illustrator yet, so this is going to be fun. Looking forward to it. Thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. So for uh, anyone that's not familiar with you, they may have seen your covers and not know it, but can you go ahead and introduce uh, yourself, please? Yeah, sure. So I am a freelance uh, full-time illustrator, and I do okay. basically my, my main sort of uh, bread and butter is book covers, and I also do... Um, other private commissions uh, and some portraits. Um, I generally work on fantasy and sci-fi book book covers mm -hmm. uh, for the main part. Uh, there is some YA fantasy stuff in there as well, but mainly, you know, your average fantasy and sci-fi stuff. Um, okay, so when COVID hit, I lost my day job, mm -hmm. and I decided that. I was going to ditch the soul sucking nine to five. <laughs> and I was going to take the leap and become a full time illustrator, which is something I've been thinking about for a very long time. Uh, before that, I was a full time graphic designer uh, for many years with a somewhat mm -hmm. brief stint in concept art and video games. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. And on top of that, um, I'm a bit of a been around the world a bit. I've lived in four different countries, lived and worked in four different countries. England, Australia, Canada, and now Slovakia at the end of 2020. Uh, beyond that, um, I love movies, cycling, traveling, working out, playing guitar. Pretty nice. standards, I guess. So you almost ran out of English speaking countries, had to go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was the U.S. Uh, you could have gone to, but I, did, I didn't. I didn't try to get a green card, so uh, I didn't. I didn't, you know, do the U.S. route, but pretty much everywhere else. So <laughs> nice, nice. That's awesome. So yeah, I'm. I'm excited to kind of talk to you, get to know you a little bit better. I'm excited to say hi to Bo Kelly. Hey, afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I want to talk a little bit about covers first because you know I haven't talked to like a cover artist yet. So now that I have you, I'm going to pick your brain. <laughs> sure. So first of all, I want to share something I don't think I've shared on stream yet. I've definitely talked before once or twice about uh, this book that I wrote a long time ago that is not consistent with the genres that I want to write in the future. But I don't think I've shown you just how bad my cover was <laughs> literally this was made by an amazon cover generator because at the time i put this out i was like hey don't judge a book by its cover right and like yes. in hindsight i can see how uh poor marketing decision that was you know but um but i want to talk about this cover and i want it to because it's it's an example that we can use because it's mine where we can say that it's bad and we can talk about bad covers um so what uh what makes that cover not great simon and while you're answering that i'm going to share it on the screen here there we go so go ahead like i mean i'm sure you agree that this is not the best most effective cover for this book in part because it doesn't really tell you anything about what it's about so you know tell us yeah, I would say, I would say honestly, that's probably the the main thing that that doesn't speak to me. Um, there's no indication of narrative or story. I have no idea what this book is about. Looking at this co the cover of this book, it could be uh, historical fiction. It could mm. be um, a travel book. Mm. It could be anything really. 
Uh, I don't really know what it's about at all. Um, other things, it's a little empty, mm. and the spacing of things is kind of <laughs> the spacing, of, the spacing the, of things is kind of similar. Yeah, Bo um, and Chad saying it's poop colored is what made me laugh. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that. There's that. There's yeah. no striking design. There's no energy. There's no flow. Um, I'm not getting a sense of the 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 visuals working with the text at all. Mm. Um, I mean, if I was designing this cover, this is how I would start. I would start with putting everything on the cover and then just like, okay, well, what can we do here? Well, that's interesting. That's it. I didn't realize that that was a part of your process. Okay. Well, if I was, if I was designing, if I was, you know, doing the graphic design part, mm -hmm. this is how I would start. I was just like, getting on there and okay well what can we do with this how can right. we make this exciting um the other thing is is that i can't tell how good the image is what quality it is but it doesn't look like it's fantastic would i be right in saying that uh, i guess like it's it's a, it's not a um, high res so and like so this cover that i made like 13, uh, I guess more like 12 years ago for this book. You know, it's a coming of age historical fiction novel and it's set in Seville, Spain. So I mm -hmm. went and I found a public domain piece of art that shows like the harbor from Seville, Spain. And that's what that is in the middle. And then mm -hmm. I used this Amazon cover creator to generate the rest. And you know, it yeah, it does a, a poor job of doing the things that a cover's supposed to do. It doesn't it doesn't communicate like genre, it doesn't communicate anything about the story. You you've made good points that I hadn't even thought of about like how the, the relationship between the text and the cover is <laughs> not great. Po Bo makes the great point that it's poop colored, which I don't think did it any favors, you know. <laughs> well, I mean I it worked it, for the division code, right? So <laughs> maybe poop is yeah. the secret sauce, you know. <laughs> Super sauce is poop. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? All right. Um, but I want it. Go ahead. What was I going to say? Um, Something a lot more uh, uh, um, thoughtful. No, I, I think maybe it's difficult. To, like if you look at it from a, a small size, if I looked at that across the bookstore or I looked at it uh, as a thumbnail on Amazon, yeah. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't jump out at me and say, you need to look at me. You need to check me out right now. It's right. kind of like, eh. Right. No, and that's, a, yeah, I mean, this was uh, self-published to the Kindle store, and I didn't even think at the time of how important thumbnail version is, you know? And that's maybe the most important. I mean, because, the, you know, if you're going to be exclusive to Amazon, as so many indies are, you know, they're going to see it on mm -hmm. Amazon that way. Um, you know, you, it's got to be eye-catching, you know? Having, so, having a quick read on, on something like a book cover is important. Um, yeah. Quick reads on illustration aren't always important, but in most cases they are because you mm -hmm. have fractions of a second to get people interested in whatever the product is that you're promoting. Right. So, um, yeah. So let's get into a good cover. <laughs> <laughs> you've you've made a couple covers recently that I really really like. I think they do the job that a cover needs to do really well. So let me go ahead and mm -hmm. I want to start with. Um, I think we'll start with the the without the text overlay, and we'll look at this gorgeous beauty. Much nicer. So for me. One of the things I like about this cover briefly, and of course I'll let you talk about your cover and you can, I'd love to hear what you think works well. Like you've, of course, like you've given plenty of like negative space at the top and the bottom for the author name and the title and that sort of thing. <laughs> but like, yes, as Richard is saying, pew, pew, like it communicates genre so beautifully. And not only like, not only is it doing a good job of communicating that it's like pew pew sci-fi with the eh, I don't like that actually I like this one uh, with the spaceship back there but like this particular story 
the main character is in a sci-fi setting, so he's got a uh, he's got his uh, pistol, but it's also sort of a, a science fantasy that it's like lots of magic. So he's also got his wand out, and I love that you included both on that cover. Um, so like again, like sort of a, a, a an interesting image grabs your attention, works at lots of different sizes, um, but it's really it's start it's communicating a lot to you about what to expect in the story, and for me. Like that's what I think makes this a good cover. But Simon, go ahead. Tell us like you know some of the things that you did that that made you happy with this cover. Uh, okay, so there was a lot that went into this cover actually. Um, mm -hmm. There was a ton. So I basically had to design everything that was on this cover. Everything you mm -hmm. see on there, I had to concept out and design um, from the look of the actual character. Um, the gun had to be concepted out. We looked at a ton of uh, handguns that are, you know, present in the world today, and handguns mm -hmm. that have been used in science fiction and movies and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the wand had to be concepted out. Uh, the character's outfit had to be completely uh, concepted out. Mm -hmm. uh, the spaceship had to be done, and then also the world, the environment that he's in, the little uh, space station in the background had to be designed. So before you even get to the cover, you have a, a literal crap ton of work that goes in there <laughs> to make this look cohesive. Mm -hmm. You know, or back in the day when I was younger, I would just wing this stuff. Mm. But you can always tell when someone's winged it because it doesn't have the depth. It doesn't have the cohesion of all the elements working together because they've been designed specifically to work together. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So that's that's one thing that this cover really has going for it. Um, the other thing is is that it kind of hits you in the face. It's pretty simple. It's like there's this guy. He's got a gun. He's got a wand. He's got a cape. There's a spaceship in the background. He's on some sort of like space environment. Yeah, okay, so is it? It's magic with a bit of I don't know some sort of cowboy stuff going on. With mm -hmm. the gun and stuff. Um, I'm just trying to think of that that TV series that was um, Firefly, you know, or well, that didn't have magic. Firefly, but. yeah, there you go, Firefly. Had a momentary uh, blonde moment. <laughs> no um, worries. Yeah, I love that show. Um, so it, it kind of has, yeah, it kind of has some of that vibe. Yeah. Um, okay. the, other thing, the other thing that was really good about this illustration is that there was a few things that I designed on the character that ended up in the book that weren't in the book beforehand. So. Oh really. Um, from what I understand, I think the amulet that he's yeah. wearing, I designed, and that was in the book. And then the tech that he has on his on his um, on the back of his hand, yeah, that was that was in the book. I designed that and thought, oh, that looks cool, and Will and the team <laughs> really like that, so then, well, yeah, let's stick that in the book. So that's so cool. That's one of the great things with working with Will and the team is that I have a lot of free reign, and I can make up stuff. Mm -hmm. The rail, the rails for the project aren't super narrow, mm -hmm. so I can come up with weird and wacky stuff, and you know, maybe it'll maybe it'll be accepted and put in the book, and maybe it won't. But you know, it's fun right. to just throw these things in. Yeah. Just want to change the version I'm sharing. Yeah, sure. that yeah, that's so interesting. So like when when. I just wanted to show with the you know the actual author's name and the book of the title name. And it, yeah, it works so well. You did the full design, right? So you included the text. They didn't do that on their side. Oh no, they they did the text. The text is designed. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm given an idea of what that look, looks like before, so that I can design the cover around that. Got it. So got it. Got it. We're not okay. going to have any clashing. You know, the text and the and the illustration will work together seamlessly. So. Right. Right. So, yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. So, well, I guess we'll get get into talking about that. But uh, let's look at one other cover also. Let me go ahead and okay, you are. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So this is for the second book in the series. So similar, I think, like striking and kind of you definitely are getting like a sci-fi read, but you're also this one. I thought what was neat about it is 
you don't necessarily know this at the be well you wouldn't know this having not read the series at all but even just having read the first book and getting into the second book like seeing this character this way you're kind of getting it really um helped understand the character i think a little bit more and and her bots and and whatnot so that uh, yeah i liked this one too and i really love like the way it's sort of framed with like the the bots on the sides and everything behind her and that sort mm -hmm. of thing so yeah i would love to hear a little bit about you this is obviously the uh this is the second book in the series of the last horizon you can see it says at the bottom book two we were looking at the first book in the series uh before so to, yeah talk to us a little bit about kind of the same ideas of what what made uh, this one sort of work for you? What what uh, were there elements too that you thought you know like I mean there does seem to be a continuity between the covers, right? But like what elements helped achieve that? I think the elements that helped achieve that was the spaceship in the background mm -hmm. and some of the colors. Mm -hmm. I would say um, I couldn't make it look exactly the same because. Mm -hmm. It would look exactly the same, <laughs> you know, so, and that would be boring, really. Um, there, I did feel a little bit of pressure because you come up with one cover and it's well received, and you're like, oh, that's great. Now you need to do another one. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I feel like right. All right. And yeah. the, the thing about this cover uh, for me was was challenging was that I haven't, up until this point, hadn't done a lot of mech, a lot of robot stuff. Mm -hmm. And the mech that, that that was required for this cover had to have a retro look to it. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't rely on, you know, countless pieces of concept art that you can find online and just, you know, take bits from here, there, and everywhere and make it look somewhat like what stuff looks like now. It mm -hmm. had to look like it had to have a retro look to it, but also look like it would actually fit and work with the, mm -hmm. the character. So uh, that was that was a bit challenging. Um, there's also, I don't know if you can tell, but there's quite a few different types of mech on the mm -hmm. You've got the small little guys that are flying around. You've got right. Medium-sized guys with, you know, with the scientific stuff. And then you've got the larger security bots. And then in the in the far distance, you've got the, the really big bodyguard guys. So they mm -hmm. all had to be designed, and there was there was a quite a bit of iteration and back and forth on those to get them to look right and for them to all look like they're part of the same world i think that's probably the hardest part is to make everything look cohesive um, nice. the ship had to look similar to the one on on the captain but of course i'd only done one angle of that ship so the ship basically had to be designed more there had to be more more work done to the ship to make it look um believable mm -hmm. and then the foreground uh the hangar uh, that's kind of a mix of Tron and Star Wars aesthetic because I like both of those, yep. both mm -hmm. of those IPs because um, they're so well designed and mm -hmm. they have such. They're not cluttered. They don't have all this extra stuff that you don't really need to see. They just have. It just looks right to me. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just just the way that uh, I just like the icon iconic nature of both those properties. Yeah. So. Um, initially, this cover was supposed to be set in Mel's lab. Mm -hmm. It had to, we were thinking about having it in Mel's lab, and there had to be you know some of the scientific stuff hanging around, and there had to be robots in there as well. And then we also had to see the ship somehow, maybe on a screen or in a window. Mm. So we tried to do those ideas, and then I came up with an idea of, well, why don't we do something like a celebrity's getting off the plane, or a president's getting off the plane, and they're you know, being, they're coming back to uh, their homeland or they're being uh, welcomed to some event or something. I thought, okay, well, why don't we try that? And uh, that's one, the one that ended up being picked to the cover. So. <laughs> that's so interesting. Yeah. Like, so this is a perfect segue too. Like, I was curious about how that cover came to be because like, to me, not knowing that that was the process, I thought it was kind of from a scene that's sort of later in the book. Um, that's what it sort of felt like, you know, but uh, yeah. I, so, I sort of, I totally get how you arrived at doing it with, with your concept. That's, that's really interesting. Well, um, I also wanted to do something that wasn't cliched. You know, I wanted to do something that's different. You haven't, I haven't seen many of these covers on a science fiction book. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and I was like, okay, well, let's try something that people can relate to now, but put it in a sci-fi setting. Because I think that is, that really is the, the best way to reach people. You have elements that people can relate to now in present day, but it's set, you will have other elements that are futuristic. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, you know, when we're thinking about like covers, if if you're working with an indie author, like what should an indie author expect? Um, you know, what should they bring? What what do you love when your clients kind of bring to the table to help you start the process? Okay, so I think uh, indie authors should spend time looking for artists they think are going to be suitable for their covers. First off, mm -hmm. rather than oh, I like this guy's work. Let's contact or this girl's work, whichever. I like I like their work. I'm just gonna reach out mm -hmm. without really thinking through what you want the cover to, to have, the feel you want the cover to have, the way it looks, the design. So the first thing is maybe spend some time researching artists that you've seen, maybe on Twitter, maybe Instagram, maybe other places, maybe the bookstore. I don't know. Um, Look for artists who are strong in the areas and the style that you're looking for your cover. That's that's the first thing I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I mean, there are artists that can do everything, but don't choose a landscape artist and then expect them to create a cover that's filled with figures <laughs> and, and, and vice versa. I mean, like I said, there are artists that can do equal, both of those things equally well, but in the main, most people specialize in one or the other. Sure. That makes sense. Now, once they've decided on that, then craft an email that outlines the scope of the project, description, maybe any loose visual references, a rough nice. timeline, rough mm -hmm. timeline, and have some sort of budget, well, idea of budget, well before the deadline. So in that way, both parties are on the same page very quickly. I've had a number of emails where people have reached out and it's a one or two sentence email saying, Hey, love your work. What are your rates? And I'm like, well, um, I need to know a little bit more. It's, it's kind of very difficult for me to give you a quote. For example, if, if I went, if I emailed a builder and said, Hey, I love your work. What are your rates? <laughs> Roof, the, the what are we building? Roof. Right, yeah, right, right. The actual house and extension. Uh, you need to give me an idea of what you're looking for. I can't possibly quote on nothing. So um, the other thing is that's a really interesting point, though, because I have seen some other cover artists so that have like a, a fixed price, you know. But it sounds like you're a variable price, and it depends on on how much work is involved, which makes a ton of sense because it, like some covers. <laughs> some covers are gonna have like be way easier to slap together than you know this than some other you know when you were talking about the, the cover you did for the captain and you had to really conceptualize okay what is the spaceship gonna look like what does the wand look like what does this pistol look like there's a lot of work that goes into that versus something that maybe is more contemporary and all that's sort of figured out right yeah yeah absolutely i think uh i, I for me it's it's about the complexity mm -hmm. it's about um, what the illustration is going to be used for, and who the client is. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily fair to ask someone who's just starting out to pay the same rate as somebody who's well into, you know, well well into the into the genre. I, I don't think that's necessarily that's not not the way that I operate. You know? so, that's cool. Nice. Um, yeah. So um, back to the question. Um, yeah, it's just in my in my case, I have a questionnaire which you filled out um, on my website, which has all this information. It, it takes literally I don't know how long it took you, maybe five ten minutes to fill it out. Right, a lot of it's right. pretty, you know, click this button, click this radio button, <laughs> whatever. Uh, type a sentence here, there, and that really takes care of a lot of the initial information that I need to to come to the table with an offer, really. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's basically what it is. Um, as, as regards to the budget, my budget uh, 
I'll always I'll say what the budget is, and then these things can always be negotiated. You're never set in stone. So. Sure. Okay. Cool. Cool. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, your process. I mean, we've kind of been talking about it already, but uh, more. Let me see. Let's make this look good. I want to talk about you know what it's actually like while you're doing the work, and you have this really cool YouTube channel that I think is underappreciated. People should go check out your YouTube channel. But you. like, we can, you can you have a whole walkthrough of like making some of the covers you've made, which is really really neat. Um, so. From the like author's perspective, though, I guess when you're kind of at this point, most of your back and forth with the author is is mostly done because yeah, you're showing on the screen kind of your different uh, concepts you had. What I can't remember the what the phrase you had for what you called those on the top left. Those are thumbnails. You just, okay, so just thumbnails, and you cut kind of rough them out, right? Yeah, they're just uh, small little super small little um, line drawings just mm -hmm. to get the point across, to get the idea across. I try to make mm -hmm. them as uncluttered as possible so it's easy to really see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you're not investing a lot of time into it. Um, and then people can make a decision pretty quickly. Right, right. So then, yeah, you're, the author client is making a decision on like which kind of direction from these different thumbnails to go. And then you're sort of, you're, you're building that out. You were showing, it was showing on the screen um, kind of the, the front and back uh, as a thumbnail. Yeah. And then, so what are we seeing right now? Like in the, in the sort of main focus of, of again, your YouTube video, you're working on the illustration. Is this the final on the top left or? No, the top left is the, the stage after the thumbnails. That's the color sketch. Okay. And so once I finish the thumbnails and um, we decide on the direction that we want to go with the layout, then I will start putting some colors down so that the, the author can see the relationships between everything and how it's going to look potentially at the end of you know at the end of the process. And I find that um, this is really helpful for not only me because I can figure everything out, but also for the authors so they can really envisage what roughly it's going to look like. Yeah, love it. So, and is that thumbnail part where we were looking at earlier? Is that the um kind of the first step? Is that the first thing that you have back and forth with the author of, of determining what things are going to look like? Yeah, that's that's the first step um, between me and the author. And generally, generally what happens is I'll come up with a bunch of thumbnails that are chicken scratch <laughs> that that even I can't really tell what's going on. If I, <laughs> if, I, if I do the thumbnails and then I go away and have lunch or something and come back and I'm like, what the hell is that? Oh, so then I go over them again and clean them up so that uh, I know and you know the author or the client will know exactly what I'm trying to convey here. And then once we have the color sketch, now you're seeing um, one of the reference shots that I took, which mm -hmm. is my wife. Who, my wife kindly kindly volunteered <laughs> to be nice. part of the reference reference uh, photograph stage, uh, which is after you've done the color sketch, then you. Well, I do. I look for reference online. I also always shoot my own reference photos um, for things mm. like hands and faces and body proportions and you know, mm. getting the nitty gritty things down that people, if, when they first look at a cover and if something's wrong, they'll know immediately. That if uncanny hands, valley, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If the hand's wrong, people will know within a second. If the face is wrong, they go, eh, something wrong with that face. Mm -hmm. So you really have to nail those things. They have to be spot on yeah yeah super cool and again like i just really love seeing the art come together this way i right? like yeah and uh, this big like time lapse how long the video is 25 minutes uh how long did it actually take you to go the full distance with this cover that we're seeing here this one this one was a bit of a monster uh, <laughs> Uh, I think this took about 50 something hours to do. It was user, it took a long time to get this right. Um, and that's that's after you've done like reference photos and the color sketch and everything, right? That's 
and the concepting and the character and all the elements that go with the robots and yeah there's a ton yeah. of work that goes into this and yeah a ton. that's so cool yeah you guys got to go check out his YouTube channel because there's more of this for lots of your covers and it's just super fascinating. As someone that like has zero talent in the visual arts, I think, you know, I think it's especially fascinating. Um, well, the YouTube channel is set up um, to try and help other artists you know, level up their game and, and see, you know, if there's anything they can take away from that, they can learn, they can, oh, I never thought about doing that maybe stuff. And, you know, that's what I, that was the main, the main crux of doing that because when I started out as, as an artist, I had no idea what I was doing. I was right. literally scrabbling around in the dark. Um, obviously, this was pre-internet, and mm. trying to get that information was like very difficult. Nowadays, it's much much easier. But yeah. even still, if you're only looking for YouTube stuff, cobbling cobbling all that stuff together and trying to figure out some sort of like plan to improve, or even knowing what's good and what's not good, that can be difficult. So, right. You know, that's, right. that's the whole idea behind the YouTube channel. Yeah. yeah. No, that's all. Yeah. It's amazing these days where you can just, you can literally find a YouTube video on anything that you want to learn. But yeah, uh, I think we're both, awesome. we're both old enough to, to remember when that wasn't the case. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, the internet is great and sometimes not so great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So yes, uh, Simon Carr, but you know, like you, you started, you didn't know what to do, but now you're doing covers for New York Times bestselling authors. So like you've yeah. figured some things out. <laughs> I love that we've we've talked about kind of your process and how it starts with uh, that questionnaire. And then you're doing multiple elements there once you really kind of finish the negotiations on what your rate is going to be and having an understanding of what the uh, the author needs. Um, you do those thumbnails, you do that color sketch, and then you get into doing the the, the full cover. Um, super cool. We've talked about you know how that is your your process. Now I want to get into like a little bit more meta a little bit. What do you see as some of the trends in cover design right now? I have to imagine that that's something you try to kind of keep an ear out for and, or an eye out for and, and see like what are other artists doing and what what is working kind of in the industry and the genres, right? I think generally um, outside of science fiction and fantasy art, there's a lot of vector stuff going on. Hmm. A, lot of, um, a lot of making the, the, the text and the titles have uh, illustrative flourishes and okay. designs with, within them. So the hmm. text becomes far more integrated into the actual illustration as well. I've seen a lot of that going on. Not so much, like I said, in the science fiction and fantasy genres, but certainly in other genres. Um, a lot of it is you know, bold and iconic, uh, mm. heavily contrasted images, mm. uh, still lots of photography, mm -hmm. um, which is fine. Um, and now, unfortunately, a flood of AI covers. Well, that was going to be the next thing I want to talk about was, yeah, generative AI in cover design. And I'm just, just going to say that and let you speak. <laughs> you know? Well, a lot of people have already, you know, uh, thrown their two cents in here. Um, sure. And, you know, what I'm going to say isn't, isn't all mm. that new. I mean, generative AI is one of those things that, it, you know, the cat's out of the bag. Pandora's box is being opened. Sure. You know, it's there. We're going to have to deal with it. It's like COVID. It's always going to be there. We're just going to have to deal with it now. Um, right. Obviously, it's caused a huge disruptive shift in book cover and illustration world in general. It's cut a lot of uh, lower tier jobs out, which is terrible for people trying to get into the industry. Because right. generally, generally, that's where illustrators cut their teeth on the on the, the lower tier jobs. A lot of those are going to AI, which is extremely unfortunate and not happy about that, obviously. Um, but now that it's here, I think the first thing that needs to happen is all the legal wrangles need to be worked out. Hmm. So the AI companies need to stop stealing people's my uh, st stealing people's work and literally taking you know their livelihoods away from them. They need to stop doing that. They need to stop scraping the internet. Um, after that, I kind of see once that's all sorted out and you know both parties are reasonably happy. I see AI uh, generative art is kind of like 
clip art was back in the day. I don't know if you remember what clip art is. Sure. But basically, um, there would be a pool of, of visual art that uh, the illustrator and the AI company, they fully know what the parameters are. The illustrator yeah. will make it. They will make it for the company. They will get paid for that. And then there will be a set of illustrations that uh, the AI company can draw from, not yeah. everywhere, just particular sets that are agree agreed upon, copyrighted, et cetera. And then going forward, I think, you know, once that's in place, I can see AI as being super helpful for super fast idea generation. Right. Like be, you, you can come up with ideas that you may not necessarily have thought of very, very quickly. And so I think sure. for idea generation, uh, it's a valuable tool. But I don't think it should be used for finished illustrative work. And it certainly shouldn't be a replacement for a targeted and focused illustration, which would be done only by a real artist. Right. So, no. I mean, that's kind of my two cents on it, because I think that's, for my mind, the most realistic outlook. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, right. I think you're absolutely right that you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. I could, wish you could, you know, no. but no. yeah, no. there's so many things that way with uh, technology and progress, you know. But um, yeah, the, yeah. I, but I, I totally hear what you're saying. Of like in a in a better future, it could be uh, sort of like stock photography is used, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so and that would, I, yeah, I, I totally think that that's that's the use of it. That's the value of it. Like, mm -hmm. like I said, mm -hmm. not for finished illustrations. You know? I've seen some. Uh, you know, I've played with some of them just to play with them. And like, so there are some times where they get really goofy mistakes, really just, just, oh, yeah. you know, like yeah. not, not good. I think but, they're at a stage now where you can pretty much pick them. You can look at mm -hmm. an illustration and go, yeah, that looks like AI. It's got you know sweet. what? Like, I bet you can because you have the eye for it because you do it all the time. But I, there are some where I look at them and I'm like, I don't know. I, you know, there's. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I mean, they're getting was, better all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a, I think Mark Lawrence, uh, he's a indie author where he did one, he did like a blog post where he was looking at some like generative uh, images versus some non-generative images and like doing a poll to see if people could distinguish which ones were which and they didn't get it right. But they, he also did that same thing with uh, generative uh stories like short stories or, or snippets and people were wildly wrong on that when that's you know continuing to develop so that's <laughs> that's in bold that's new world that we'll be in that's, yeah that's not good either not for for someone like yourself it's, right that's terrible right yeah so i think they'll get to a point where there'll be certain markers where publishers will receive manuscripts and they'll get through a few pages and go yeah i don't think so this looks like an ai looks like an ai deal to me so hopefully try right try again <laughs> yeah 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 try again um cool all right so uh yeah interesting what you're saying about trends too when, when going back to the trends for just a second you were mentioning kind of uh more vector and also like the the text that's integrated but you're seeing that outside of the sff uh sort of genres are there any covers that sort of you, you can think of off the top of your head that are like a good example of that sort of thing or, or nothing off the top of your head. I'm not putting you on the spot a little bit right now. Um, no, nothing off the top of my head. Okay. Sure. I, think of any, I mean, if we had like you know, 20 minutes, I'm sure I can go on Instagram. And, <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. Um, we, don't, we don't need to spend that. Some of, them, some of them are really, really good. Yeah. Um, That's cool. Yeah. 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 Very neat. Very neat. Um, okay. So let we've talked, you know, about your process. We've talked about your work. We've talked a little bit about good covers versus bad covers. And if anyone's joining us more recently and you haven't seen all this, you can go check out the replay on YouTube. But, um, uh, but I want to get into talking a little bit about you because <laughs> this is person behind the pages. I like to talk with the creative about, you know, themselves also, because I think that's uh, interesting and adds even more appreciation to their work. So, one thing that I love talking with, you know, different creatives about is how, like, their career path. Because with very few exceptions, I think there aren't too many folks that are doing, you know, 
creative work, whether it's writing books or making covers or that sort of thing that have just, you know, all right, this is the thing that they settled on when they were like six years old. And it just was a clear path from out of high school into that thing, you know? Um, yeah. So you, like so many other folks have had a couple different jobs along the way, right? I think you were, yeah. you were mentioning that you did some graphic design, not before that you were <laughs> like a bartender, a factory worker, a supermarket shelf stacker, uh, but a couple kind of stand out too, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about studio manager and concept artist. Tell me about these things, please. Sure. So uh, the studio manager was when I was uh, a graphic designer in mm -hmm. Australia. Uh, I was working with a publisher, and so uh, I was the studio manager. I was um, managing a couple of other designers, and I was also art directing illustrators on books. And then I was involved in meetings with authors to work out, you know, best layouts, ideas for covers, um, placements, uh, layouts for placements of pictures, and you know, all those sorts of things. So mm -hmm. I did that, and also in the video game company, I was a studio manager there, where I basically just made sure they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, uh, <laughs> rather than just sit on YouTube or, you know. Or playing other games playing, all the time. <laughs> playing games or, you know, whatever they were doing. So yeah. that was that was basically uh, what that job entailed. Um, and what was the other question? The other? Uh, so the, was it the, the concept artist? You were... Oh, the concept artist. Yeah, that, the concept artist was also for the video game company. It was a small, mm -hmm. small startup, mm -hmm. uh, mobile games company. And mm -hmm. um, I did some of the concept art for uh, a couple of their... Couple of their games that uh, they they did so um, yeah the concept concept art stuff was fun um, yeah and, and it, you know it's kind of what I'm doing now with covers is just you, you don't see it right it's just, it's just a different avenue it's not for a video game it's for a book cover and right I think you know if you want the best if I want to get the best result then it's just iteration and designing before you get to the final right right. That makes sense. And the other jobs, um, the supermarkets, uh, the supermarket shelf stagger, factory worker. <laughs> so the factory worker, uh, I worked in a, a factory. Uh, I think it was candles and potpourri. I don't know if you know what <laughs> potpourri is. Of course, yeah, yeah. So you were just like assaulted with scents all the time. <laughs> oh, God, it was one job I did, and it was over Christmas and New Year's, and it was se seven o'clock at night till seven in the morning. Oh man. Yeah, that was that was that was a crazy job. And then other factory assembly line jobs I've done. Um, working in the supermarket it was you know behind the behind the till stacking shelves and stuff. A bartender. Um, the bartender jobs were in the UK mm. and one of them was working in what, what they what they had there is like a leisure center which had it had bowling alleys, it had a cafeteria, it had a bar, and then it had also, a laser gun game was called Quasar. I don't know if you've heard of that. No, that's cool. But um, and that was like in the early '90s. So what? You know, you're wow. in, you're in this you're in this blacked out room, and it's got fluorescent stuff, and it's got like little things you can hide behind, and it's got you know the dry ice, and people have these like packs they're wearing, and they're shooting laser guns and stuff. Um, so I was a laser gun marshal as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty I, neat yeah i've done cleaning jobs uh you name it i've done a lot of odd jobs to get to this point other than you know the graphic design and illustration yeah that's really cool so you've also you mentioned that you were in australia you mentioned in the uk uh and on your website it says you live now in slovakia uh so you've been around a little bit but you know something i just noticed too you, you, I think that you had mentioned that you were uh, originally from the UK, but you don't have what I would consider a typical UK accent. What's up with that? <laughs> God, no, I have, I have no UK accent at all. Yeah. Um, the, reason, the reason for that is that I left the UK when I was four, wow. four years old. And uh -huh. so, you know, I learned to read and write in Canada. Mm. Um, and and I, I guess the accent is just impregnant. It's just imprinted sure. on me. You know, it's like, when I moved to Australia, I did have a bit of an Australian uh, lilt to the way I spoke. But then as soon as I moved back to Canada, it was, it was straight back. You know, it didn't last too long. And 
now in Slovakia, I'm you know I'm learning the language, so nice. The accent, the accent is just it's, it's there. It's never going. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm uh, in a the Discord chat with a bunch of different uh, authors from all over the world, which is super cool. Uh, but a number of them are from Australia, so I'm hearing a lot of like sweet as lately, and <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of the the. Uh, Australian little slang that's that's just fun. That's not necessarily the things that we think it is. Not so much uh, crikey and shrimp on the barbie as I would imagine. <laughs> no, but uh, I, when I first moved there, uh, before I moved there, I, I knew there were you know a few sayings. Yeah. And then when some of these sayings were said to me in all seriousness, it was kind of <laughs> like, well, have people actually say those things? <laughs> sure. All right. Okay. I. I can think of one instance. I was uh, I was at a barbecue, surprisingly, and I was having a conversation with with someone, and uh, he actually said to me, "Fair Dinko." Yeah. <laughs> I, I was like, "Okay, okay, I'm right." I'm gonna roll with that. And then, <laughs> uh, after about six months, you don't even think about it. It's just that's what yeah. people say. That's just, just yeah, just, yeah. Just it's like. It. And when, like when Lou for the bathroom in the UK, just, just it's, yeah. it is what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. and and, and uh, similarly, when I moved back to Vancouver, people had funny little sayings as well. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember, "You bet" was one of those sayings. I was like, "All right," or they would say something like, "And you know what?" And I'd be like, "What?" <laughs> I've never heard that before anywhere I'd ever lived. So really, you know, wow. Every every place I've lived has little quirks and you know things that people say that you just get used to over time. Yeah. All right. We're gonna go just slightly off the rails because this is uh, this is interesting to me. One of the things I think is fascinating about different parts of the world too, it related to that language in a different way though, is like the things that sort of people take for granted in the area that they live in. Right. So mm -hmm. I. I lived, I grew up in Southern California and then I lived in Central Florida. Now I live in Wilmington, North Carolina, and occasionally it might snow here, but I haven't lived in a place where it's like proper cold at all. So a friend of mine that used to live in Florida, he was thinking of taking a job that was in Vermont and they, <laughs> they have very extreme, well, extreme to me, cold, you know, um, there, you know, they have actual furnaces that burn oil, which is just not something that you have in Florida at all. And it was like, it was a, a whole, I know you're laughing because like, you know, for someone that lives in the cold, like that's totally normal, but someone that doesn't live in the cold, it's, it's not right. So like, yeah, but yeah. like the maintenance for that sort of thing and like the, the, the way of life and, and like, uh, I heard somewhere else that like in uh, other cold places like that, the windows will freeze shut. Which like I don't open the windows a ton, but like it's something I haven't experienced, you know. But I have experienced hurricanes. So, anyway, like you living in these literally different corners of the globe, uh, are there any things that sort of stick out to you as like as something that's so uh, maybe not unique, but like special about that area? That's like I mean, I have to imagine in Slovakia there are certain things about uh, you know life there on a daily basis that is just wildly different from life in Australia. Besides the obvious of like the language, but things that like things that are are so routine that people don't think about, but it's there. And when you're living there, it becomes something that like you know you you are you are suddenly very aware of. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So when I moved to Australia uh, from England, in England it's it, it's quite usual for people to have double glazing on their windows, okay. and for the houses are all insulated. Mm -hmm. right? And when I moved to Australia, there's houses there that have no insulation. <laughs> no, okay. They have no yeah. insulation. Mm -hmm. So when people when I when I first got there, I hear people complain in the winter. Oh my God, it's eight degrees, so cold. I'm like. Eight degrees. That's it's not really that cold. <laughs> but if your house is insulated, that's pretty cold. That's pretty. Yeah. So that that's one of the things that that really stuck out at me when I moved to Australia. Apart from um, the food was different and uh, the way people spoke. It's and a perfect they, example because, like, I'm sure, like, the people that live there, that's 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 the, of course they're not insulated. No one insulates their homes. But yeah, to me too, that's like, are you kidding? Like, <laughs> yeah. It's, to me, it was like, oh, that's completely bizarre. Why would you 
insulate your home when you're building it, it to me it just seems so rudimentary but um yeah like i had a house in australia that was built in the 60s and there was no insulation in this house uh, because wow. we renovated it i renovated it it had a it had an old uh heater in the living room mm -hmm. and we took you, you couldn't get parts for it anymore that's how old this thing was and so mm -hmm. we took it out and there was a hole there was a hole between you know the, the drywall the chip rock drywall and the outside brick and it was nothing it was just a hole so i could i can actually you know take one of those bricks out and i could see outside <laughs> in my living room that wasn't a window so <laughs> <laughs> that was a little surreal yep yep yeah. That's wild. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, we you've been all over the place. You're living in Slovakia now. You've you've done all these jobs. You're now like a, a full time freelance artist. I think. How what percentage of your work is book covers? What percentage? Okay, let's think about that. I'd say it's at this stage. It's eighty five to ninety percent. A lot, um, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. It it wasn't like that when I when I uh, when I started. Mm -hmm. uh, I started I started uh, doing freelance illustration as a side gig in twenty sixteen, and that was a lot of uh, TTRPG stuff. Oh, cool. Uh, okay. Yeah, and uh, typically that's where a lot of artists in in the genre that I work in, that's where they start. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know you're doing character illustrations or you're doing full illustrations, and it's basically where you cut your teeth. Um, there isn't, you know, a huge amount of pressure, mm -hmm. um, and the jobs aren't terribly well paid. But at that stage, you're just you're hungry and you you want to cut your teeth and you want to you know get some jobs under your belt. So. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear a little bit about like what your day to day is like and your kind of daily routine, but also like. Um, how, you know, being a full-time freelance artist, like when you made that leap, uh, how <laughs> how did that feel? Okay, so um, can I swear on this? On this? <laughs> you can now. Yes, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I think I think it was a, a balance between being scared shitless mm -hmm. and um, and not want to have to look back years from now and, and be full of regret. And so for me, the weight of regret was heavier mm. than the risk of doing this. Yeah. I, I've i wanted to do this since I was like, you know, a little kid. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're not getting any younger, right? Uh, yeah. No, I'm not getting any younger. And I was just like, well, when am I getting, when am I going to do this? When am I going to stop taking the safe road the comfortable mm -hmm. road and mm -hmm. you know actually make a go of this and yeah. you know, try and do this for real and for me it was like well if i don't do this now i don't think i'm going to do it because as you get older security becomes more and more important mm -hmm. uh, when you're in your 20s and your early 30s it's not so much of a big deal but when you get up there then security does become a big deal and it becomes harder and harder to break away from your comfort zone. Right. At least that's what it was for me anyway. Yeah. And so when I lost my, my day job in 2020, it was kind of decided for me. <laughs> like, okay, well, you can go back to doing the comfort thing, but being, you know, crazy unhappy doing that and trying mm -hmm. to cram, trying to cram doing the illustration in on weekends and evenings. Yeah, or or you can, you know, go for it and and do that. And so, for me, it's like, well, I'm going to try. I'm going to try and see what happens. At that point, were you already doing some freelance, like on the side, or was it, you know, did you have to start from absolute zero when the day job kind of ended? I did have some freelance on the side. I had okay. some clients, a couple of clients that I was working with. But I was stressed. It wasn't enough to live on. Sure. Um, and it wasn't. At the time, I was working on some historical fiction stuff, some World War II stuff. No, oh, interesting. As well as uh, some book covers with um, an author that I've worked with for many years. 
Um, and the, the historical fiction stuff is, it was interesting to work on, but uh, it's not really the way I want my work to go. Mm. Um, and uh, the, the crazy amount of detail and research that, that's involved with that, um, you really have to be into it um, to sort of deal with um, getting all the details right. And yeah. it's, interesting, it's interesting for me, but uh, it's, it doesn't get me out of bed in the morning, if you know what I mean. I, uh, I I definitely have some understanding of how like historical fiction might be kind of fun for a while, but then maybe not something you want to do over and over and over and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I get it. So, so, that, so yeah, so no, I I didn't I didn't have um, a huge safety net. It was like, okay, well uh, now you need to uh, put your put the pedal to the metal and um, get this going. Yeah. So what is uh what is the you know what what's getting you out of bed in the morning now <laughs> what and what does what does the day to day routine look like for you now? Okay, so uh, my routine, um, my my golden time is the morning. So I never used to be a morning person, but I basically am now. And so <laughs> uh, my alarm goes off at six a.m. I get up around six thirty. Um, before I get out of bed, I meditate because that just it just evens things out for me mentally. Good practice. Um, yeah, it just it just works for me. Um, and then you know, uh, and then it's straight into the work. It's basically I, I review uh, what I've got to do for the day. Uh, at the start of the week or on Sundays, I go through exactly everything that I want to go get through for the week, and I plan out and strategize exactly what I'm going to do. And so that when I get up in the morning, I can just get straight into it. I can look at you know, things that I that I want to get on with, and I get on with that. And the mornings are spent painting and working on commissions or mm -hmm. personal work for sending off to clients or to new clients, prospective clients. Uh, in the afternoons, uh, it's mainly writing, emails, social media posting, YouTube videos for searching new clients. Um, there's some Slovak practice thrown in there as well because I've got to try and get this language under my belt. Uh, it's very hard, by the way. And on top of that, um, there's always a health component during the day. So that's working at the gym, cardio, bike rides, nature walks, yoga stretching, um, which becomes, it, it's very important, uh, especially with what I do, because um, I still don't have a standing desk, it's on the list, but um, you can't sit down all day and expect you know your body to work day after day after day when you haven't really taken care of it. So. That's a that's a very important component of the day. Yeah. That's wise. Yeah, yeah. Got to keep moving. Got yeah. Totally get that. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I, it's I, I find it fun, especially the people that are full time in whatever creative endeavor, how they've chosen to like structure their day. But that's uh, I think that's great that you sort of found your golden hour, and then we're able to sort of structure things around that, right? Well, it, yeah, it took a while. Um, I know for me that you know between hours of two and four in the afternoon, it's it's a creative dead zone. Uh, there's many times where I would sit down to do some painting during that time, and after that time, I would look back and go, "Okay, well that's that's garbage. You're going to have to do it again." <laughs> so um, I know basically that um, unless I'm under a real deadline mm -hmm. and have to get something done really quickly, um, that I generally don't do a lot of creative work in between the hours of two and four. Right. It's after four and before two, then I know I can get my best work done. Yeah. I would be like, okay, this is my admin time. This is when I answer emails, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Very cool, Simon. All right. I want to kind of end with the last question. That's sort of a fun one. You, uh, you apparently won the Megadeth Christmas card competition. That sounds super cool. <laughs> I want to hear a little bit about that. How did you, even find out about that, and then what was what was it like, uh, you know, doing the work and then winning? Okay, so I'm going to preface my answer by saying that I have been a huge metal fan for many, many years, many years. Um, I'm not even going to tell you how long because it's it's been a long time. But um, I, I will say that um, I saw Megadeth first at in the Donington Monsters of Rock Festival in the UK. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. 
but that... it was the it was what download is now beforehand mm -hmm. um and basically what you had is you had iron maiden headlining oh sick you had, yeah and that was on the uh seventh sun tour and you had um it was it was crazy it was crazy good and we had gnr we had uh, megadeth uh, oh. who else but it was it was crazy that was my first metal show that i'd ever seen it was like a hundred over a hundred thousand people there it was nuts oh my god it yeah nuts. it was quite an experience i'll never forget that ever i think, David <laughs> roth played. I think yeah i think david Lee roth played with steve i as well that was nuts um, he's so got like cool. dropped right into the deep end with your first show right <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It was just like it was mind blowing to me. I was I was eighteen at the time. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> um, so yeah, back in twenty eleven, uh, I heard about the competition through uh, a friend of a friend. As I didn't even know this competition existed. Right. Um, and so, what I, I I thought about it for about a half an hour, and I was like, yeah, fuck it, I'm going to do that. Why not? I'm going to. It was, of course, it was you know right at the up, up to the up to the wire because it was only five days to the deadline. <laughs> you had until like the twenty second, I think, of December to to come up with something. I heard about on the seventeenth or the eighteenth in the evening, right? <laughs> okay, we're not gonna be sleeping for the next four days, so no problem. <laughs> um, so I I looked through all all the album covers and um, and I knew that you know I had to have Vic on the front cover there. Um, and he's pretty difficult to to uh, to paint, and so I I, I wanted um, I envisaged that Vic would be climbing out of uh, a chimney on a roof with with presents, and um, and he would have some presents and uh, on the roof, whatever, and snow and icicles and stuff, and then we you know we'd have the logo and stuff on there, and so I just crammed it, and then um, I sent it off thinking uh, I don't know I did my best. I probably it was probably last minute. It's probably not going to get chosen, and then uh, surprisingly, I ended up winning, which kind of blew my mind. Yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. Um, and then so for the prize, I got some swag, which was nice. But then I also got to speak with the man himself on Christmas morning. So Christmas morning, Dave Mustaine calls me up, and he goes, uh, "Hello, is this Simon?" I said, "Yes, it is." Hey, this is Dave Mustaine from Megadeth. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. I'm just like, what? Uh, I mean, we spoke for like 30, 40 minutes. Uh, super chill. Wow. Super big, that guy, very intelligent, very articulate. Uh, yeah. Even on, even on Christmas morning. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that was, that was a crazy, surreal experience. That's so cool. Go from, you know, watching this band with 100,000 other fans to being on the phone with the frontliner, you know, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I've seen Megadeth like five or six times, um, and they always put on a great show, like a really good show. I've never been disappointed uh, in any of the shows I've seen. And then to actually speaking to, you know, Dave Mustaine, because I know the whole history of, you know, how Megadeth started and the whole Metallica thing. Um, so to me, that was just, uh, it's just one of those, you know, things you're never gonna forget. That's rad. Yeah. Super cool. What a fun place to kind of wrap things up. Simon, this has been super fun talking with you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been great talking with you. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Where can uh, anyone watching find and follow you online? We kind of mentioned your YouTube channel. What, what should they search for to find your YouTube channel and then your website? At least I want to mention those two. So the website is SCAR Industries, uh, mm -hmm. S-C-A-R-R Industries.com. And then uh, social media is just at Scar Artist, which is S C A R R Artist. Mm -hmm. And the YouTube is the same. Okay. Perfect. Really Perfect. Yeah. Check out Scar Artist, guys. Go see more of his work. Go check out the YouTube channel and like his, uh, you know, illustration work. And, and just think that's just the neatest thing being able to see it actually kind of come together and the work that you do. Um, you. Yeah. Well, thanks again for being here, Simon. Thank you out there watching. I know there's some of you on Twitter now watching. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for checking me out. If you'd like, you can find me at nicholaswfuller.com. There'll be a link to my Patreon there that's free, and you can basically, it's like a newsletter right now. Um, find out all the good things that I got working on. 
And uh, yeah, if no one's told you today, you're an absolute legend. 